Hi, everyone, and welcome to our last episode of Of Dust and Light, Preaching Lent with the Eyes of an Artist. My name is Reverend Rob Cook, and I'm lecturer and director of outreach programs at Queen's College Faculty of Theology here in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. That's for our global audience, because we know we're <laughs> down worldwide now. We're we're big. Uh, <laughs> along with me is our provost and uh, professor of homiletics, Reverend Dr. Joanne Mercer. And our guest today, I'm really excited, a friend of mine, uh, and Joanne's as well. We were just reminiscing about... Uh, uh, being part of a concert series together. So it's good to be back together. Ian Foster, tell us about yourself, Ian. Hey, hey to both of you. Glad to be here. Um, I am a musician and filmmaker here in St. John's, Newfoundland. Um, so what that means is for me as the musician, I started as a singer-songwriter uh, touring around Canada, the United States, and Europe since about 2006 or so, uh, putting out records, and uh, have steadily moved... Oh, I'm sorry for banging my camera there. <laughs> uh, have steadily moved uh, into... Um, uh, some production work as well and some film uh, score work. Uh, and then that sort of led me into what has now become a parallel career for me in the film world, both with scoring uh, some projects and uh, and also being a director. So I've made a few uh, few films. Um, and the latest thing is actually coming out uh, like right around the time we're releasing this, I believe on uh, Wednesday, March 29th, I'm releasing a... Uh, a film and album project. So the album is a 12 song album, but the film uh, is basically like a, um, a silent narrative film with the music from the album, helping to tell the story of the film. So uh, that's called close to the bone. Uh, so uh, that's some of what's going on with me. Excellent. And um, his most famous claim to fame is that he was on the servers guild at the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist here in St. John's. And so, that is how my music bio starts. Exactly. <laughs> it should. And we're really going to grill you today on the finer points <laughs> of high church Anglicanism. Please do. Uh, it should be very embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm excited about this because uh, Ian and I get together from time to time for a coffee or a beer and our conversations are always so far reaching and cover so much territory from pop culture to philosophy to theology to politics to just about everything. So this should be really, really interesting today. Um, and mine and Joanne's conversations are the exact same way. So I can imagine the magic that's going to happen as we talk about uh, these readings today. So you're building it up far too much. <laughs> we're we're in the last week of Lent, and that means we're going to be uh, putting our attention towards the Palm Sunday readings uh, specifically, but also I think uh, can't really talk about the Palm Sunday readings without, you know, talking about the Passion readings as well. And so we're going to kind of drift in and out of those. Um, we always start off by throwing it to our guests to see if they have any kind of initial thoughts or inspiration uh, to share with us from the readings and the whole point of this thing this series this Lent has been to hear from people who don't do what Joanne and I do on a regular basis which is pick these things apart and uh, make a living off of this and so we're kind of blinded sometimes to some of the meaning that could be in the text and so to have someone with some fresh eyes to open up the scriptures to us <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm I'm not trying to put too much pressure on you, Ian. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. You just said I'm going to open up the scriptures on an ancient biblical text. What could go wrong? <laughs> and we're recording it. Yay! Yeah, this is great. Uh, can't wait. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we talked a little in uh, prior to recording here about um, uh, a particular song that I've loved forever. Um. And it's uh, it's a Bruce Springsteen song called Jesus Was an Only Son. And I would assume many listeners will not know that one because it's definitely not in the top 100 known Springsteen songs. Probably it's from an album called Devils and Dust. Came out in the early 2000s. 
And, uh, you know, I've just been waiting to talk about this uh, Bruce Springsteen uh, religious song uh, for the right podcast. And I finally found it. I think you don't generally hear about this song in music podcasts, but uh, I genuinely think it's a it's a very uh, just it's a very well written song that should come as no surprise given the songwriter. Uh, but it struck me many years ago that the beauty of it is that it is a um, essentially like secular retelling of uh parts of jesus life particularly you know garden of gethsemane and then the and then cavalry hill uh and the reason why it's called jesus was an only son which came from springsteen talking about the song um himself was that you know while jesus had his earthly brothers and sisters uh you know the the scenes that he's using you know him as a child in the hills of nazareth is referenced gethsemane cavalry hill he's essentially alone uh, with the exception of his mother, Mary, walking behind him um, uh, up Cavalry Hill uh, and then obviously being with him when he's when he's a child. And so ultimately, the song is a retelling of his life, but particularly uh, events around uh, the passion as being like a mother's loss of her son. And uh, I thought that was a really uh Fairly profound, you know, for the guy who wrote Dancing in the Dark, uh, pretty profound <laughs> retelling of uh, of this particular story, which like any story that is told over and over again and kind of ritualized, um, let's face it, it, you know, it can lose its impact, you know, um, when because uh, it can just become this is when we read that again, you know, uh, as opposed to actually thinking about it. And, and so I think that 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 song sort of reframes it in a way that makes you just try to imagine, uh, you know, a mother losing her son to such a horrible event. You know, you sort of, uh, it, it reignites, I suppose, the the horror and the pointlessness of it and, um, you know, tons of other emotions, the human emotion of loss, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah, we'll start there. Yeah, so one of the questions I told you I was going to post is, is, you know, going back to, you know, Ian, the acolyte, the candle bearer, the crucifer, how, how is your kind of experience of that very familiar story, you know, the Jesus story, uh, spoiler alert, he dies, um, <laughs> how, how has that changed from Ian, the, the server's guild, uh, you know, person to Ian Foster now, the award-winning singer-songwriter? Well, um, I mean, let's face it. I think that Ian, the 12, 13-year-old uh, server, uh, was probably just pretty sleepy uh, because it was, you know, 10, 30, 11 a.m. on a Sunday and he wanted to sleep in after all week at school. Like, let's be real here, you know? Uh, so. Um, I think that, you know, back to my point, I suppose that when you do something every single week, um, it becomes ritualized, which can be a comfort, of course, right? This is, you know, Rob and I have had conversations about meditation and other philosophies and sort of what is what is a communion or spiritual event? You know, is that a walk in the woods? Is it an attending church on a particular time once a week? You know, there's, there's tons of overlap there. I think uh, at that age and and given the the format, you know, it, it it was sort of just a thing you did. Like I, that's what I mean. I think that I was sort of like numb to probably the the deeper points of the story after a certain point. Uh, and and you know, it's one of the things that I've I respect about uh, both of you. You know, is that your your goals are to um, always be trying to see this stuff with fresh eyes and for the first time to actually learn any real lessons from it and to actually have it uh, mean something more. So, you know, over the years for me, that has been just a deeper interest in um, uh, more the historical context, I guess, for the Bible. You know, I, I remember right out of university, um, I was reading like Bart Ehrman, you know, misquoting Jesus and books like that, which I found to be you know, really compelling. Um, and it was funny, I think I saw him on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, like way back when that book was published, which must be going on 20 years ago now, or 15 at least. Um, and uh, and one of the things, I can't remember who said it, whether it was the author or Stewart, but it was a really interesting remark about, um, you could look at the book in a, because one of the, the quotes in the book is that there are more 
discrepancies in the Bible between editions of the Bible and there are words in the Bible because of all the different editions we have and how there's, you know, stories that weren't in the earliest versions that are in the later versions and so on and so forth. Um, but the comment that was made was like, you can look at that as a negative. You could look at that as a, uh, you know, so we can just disregard this book, or you can look at it as the positive as this is like a living document of humanity trying to understand something deeper than themselves, you know? And so that that's always been sort of the lens that I've looked at the the historical stuff through and trying to understand like whether the story is just a parable or whether it actually has some, you know, historical context for the times, uh, you know, obviously not nearly in as much detail as the two of you do for a living, but uh, that's sort of my personal interest, you know, when I do pick it up for fun to read. I mean, it is a deeply human story right everything else aside you know you i don't think you could read especially the the passion uh, story without being deeply moved by it right i'm always struck by you know just how unjust and perhaps you know from a human perspective very unnecessary that it is right that jesus was a good person he was someone who had committed his life life to helping people to, you know, to be in solidarity with the poor, with the marginalized, uh, you know, trying to make people's lives better. And then he's met with this, you know, extreme act of, of violence. And, you know, but, you know, so then on the theological side, we've spent the last, what, 2000 years trying to unpack what this story means. And there's been multiple, multiple answers and everybody who's watching this has probably got a variation on you know a theme of what is going on in this story but you know so there's though I, I like what you're saying but those two things at play right there's the historical part um you know maybe i'll put that in quotations historical part whatever that means and then there's the the theological part so it, it's just such to me it's it's a it's such a rich story and i think it's rich because of the humanity of it but it's also rich because of the the theology of it and the way that it has um, transformed people's lives and kind of just transfixed people in, in you know what this story means. Yeah, a hundred percent. And uh, you know, I think you're right that it's inextricably tied, like the history and the the nature of the text. Um, and you know. I guess one of the pieces that can be an interesting discussion as well, Rob, that you would be familiar with given your upbringing, you know, uh, that I've become familiar with as someone with friends and a partner who grew up evangelical is the nature of Christian music. And when I say that, I'm not talking about like the hymns, of course, I'm talking about like modern Christian music. And I, I listened to an interview with a comedian that I really like named Pete Holmes, who uh, grew up evangelical as well. And recently he talked about, I thought this was so great. He talked about just the idea of Christian music, like kind of upsetting him because he's like, you know, this is, you know, to tie this back into what you're saying that like this was uh, the, the crucifixion, for instance, almost feels so pointless. And it was clearly a political thing, uh, you know, and it was it was heavy. There was grit to this. Right. This is like, uh, you know, a government perceiving someone as a threat and, you know, all that stuff and and how um, Christianity is sort of based on these radical ideas. So like the idea that thousands of years later, we're like, well, we can't possibly listen to a song on the radio. You know, we need to, like, make our own version of music for people to listen to that has very specific rules about, like, what the lyrical content should be or you know, whatever, like that just feels kind of, uh, it, it feels kind of siloed, you know, uh, for something that was so, it's based on something that was so important and of the moment, you know, in its formation. Yeah. First of all, I love Pete Holmes. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, cool. He's yeah. great. Uh, He's hilarious. It, it is his show. Um, I think it might be on HBO. Um, Crashing? Crashing? Yeah. Oh, so good. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I like what you're saying about, you know, that music, because I, I grew up with that stuff. My friend, Brad Jeff, who, who's the band Saturday band leader at St. Mark's, he always says that to him, Christian music, it all sounds like you too. 
<laughs> yeah, like yeah. they're they're all trying to be YouTube. That was the the Joshua Tree was the original intro. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So but yeah, that that idea that you know this this political kind of execution now has become the center of this whole genre of music, and like like really the kind of Americanization of this whole story too, right? Is really impacted. It's like you know it. The deeper into it you go, the more it in you know that's the lens you now see it through, right? And so, um, you know, and there's a very particular interpretation of the Jesus story through that lens, right? The whole idea, yeah. Of sacrifice. And don't get me wrong, and there's a lot of joy in my life of every party making sure that a playlist contains Larry Norman and Petrus Beyond Belief just to torture Nancy. But um, nevertheless, you know, not not necessarily. Uh, <laughs> Although Larry Norman has an interesting history, but anyway, we won't we won't go there for now. <laughs> all I can say is I wish we'd all been ready. <laughs> uh, Joanna's looking at us like, "What?" <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, don't know what you're talking about, but I I would like. I mean, I like the notion. Uh, I might know the musicians you're talking about, um, but yeah, like how we uh, completely domesticate this story right we make it um you know the story of, of the passion which is should be quite radical and um decentering for us we make it serve a very hierarchical power model when it's really about um completely giving up power right um and uh, so that you know that's very we need to be aware of that and so how do we the challenge, I think, is how do we tell the story, whether we engage with, um, I'm going to have to listen to Bruce Springsteen once we finish. Uh, I've got it called up and ready to play. Um, you know, like, what can we engage to help people hear it new, hear it for the radical notion it, it, um, uh, that it's, uh, it's in its roots? Whether we have to go back to some of the historical context and try to get people to sort of see that this uh, story uh, is yeah is radical in so many ways. Um, it was interesting when you talked about that that song, Ian. Uh, I have this very uh, strong memory in one of my parishes of a lady who had written this amazing reflection that we use one year for Good Friday from a mother's point of view. And she, you know, watching her child die on the cross, and it's it's very poignant. And it's but it's not until the end of it that you recognize that this was the mother of one of the thieves, and not mm. Jesus. Right? That like, this is a very human story of of people whose mothers watch them. You know, not all. You know, um, the stories of suffering, and our world is full of stories of suffering, and full of yeah, mothers mourning. Uh, children who they didn't expect would die before them, you know, children who died horrific deaths at the hands of people of power. Um, so I think the story is still really important. Yeah. Absolutely. Before we go, because I, I, that idea of suffering is one of the things that I, I wanted us to kind of pause on for a little bit. But before we go on to that and what you were saying about the, the story, Joanne, and I know in our pre-conversation before we started recording, you had mentioned what the the importance of the Philippians reading in in either the either if you're celebrating Palm uh, the liturgy of the Palms or the liturgy of the Passion you thought that the Philippians reading kind of captured really the essence of of what we're cel I hate to say celebrating but you know what I mean what we're remembering <laughs> yes yeah yeah you know that sort of notion that uh, that the, the Christ Hymns is called that that Jesus didn't think of quality with God was something to be grasped, right? That, but emptied himself. And um, we have this sort of notion of we're here and God sort of up there, like looking down at us. Um, and I think that that, that incarnation, that, that, that reading really points to the power of incarnation, right? That, that, that barrier between us and humanity is smashed. That it is not about, um, about Jesus trying to be God, but about God's choice to uh, to be human and fully human, involved, including like this, you know, so full to include the suffering and death 
on the you know the resurrection uh, on the cross, and I think you know it really speaks to God's sort of um, God's grace and love, and uh, like there's no limits to it, right? Uh, and yeah, you know, I think that in some ways to the point that God looks at us the way we look at God, right? Like we're often looking at God as a source of wonder, wanting, people want to be, we're, you know, we live in a world people want to be like God. People want to be powerful, rich and strong and whatever kinds of images they have. When, you know, in, in Jesus, we have God willing to be weak and defenseless and vulnerable. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's really, again, that whole power thing, right? Um, it's the key. It's the key to see the humility uh, and love and compassion of God. That's what this whole week is about. And, and I'm struck too by, and I, I agree with what you're saying about what Paul's saying there, but how quickly by the end of that passage, he's right back into the trap of power and revenge because it ends by saying at the name of jesus every knee shall bend right it's kind of like you look out <laughs> god's gonna get you right like but i mean even that in itself is a very human kind of response right to again to to suffering and you know our instinct is for that kind of to for you know for, for justice we we want so if in the face of suffering, we want justice. And so Paul is, you know, even when he's starts off in a very beautiful way and talking about the nature of the cross, I'm, this might scandalize some people for me to say this, but I don't think if, I don't think Paul actually gets it. <laughs> I, I don't know that anyone, I mean, you know, Peter never got it, it. <laughs> you know, um, cause it's, <clears throat> it's like, so I don't even think that we get it. No, absolutely not. Such a radical understanding of how we are to live with one another and how we are to live, you know, be um, like it makes no sense. Well, but you know, like, so it's a beautiful thing to say as long as we keep our power structures, you know, as long as we're not threatened by it, we don't have to change, we'll just say it. Absolutely. I mean, it wouldn't be an ancient text if it didn't contain something about wiping everybody out. But uh, the reality is, like, I do think that, you know, the the vulnerability discussion is a really interesting point. I mean, we're in an interesting moment in the world right now where we don't value vulnerability very much. You know, there's been a lot of strong man, you know, <laughs> stuff on the political stage for the last, you know, however many years you want to call it, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting angle to discuss things from i think and i think when you pair this conversation with the the read the gospel reading for the liturgy of the palms which is about jesus entering into jerusalem for that last week of his life uh you know there's recent historical research that shows there would have been another procession that week too as Pilate entered into jerusalem you know with the with the legions, with the, you know, banners, with the weapons, you know, probably riding on a big powerful horse uh, to remind people in Jerusalem, you are a people who are occupied, we're in charge, you should fear us, you know, uh, stay in line, don't, don't act out. Uh, and to juxtapose that with Jesus who comes in on a donkey, peacefully, you know, people are waving palm branches, not swords and weapons, um, you know, laying down their robes in, in front of him and acclaiming him king, which itself is a deeply political act too, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that all, all culminates, I think, in what happens on what we call Good Friday, uh, but it certainly leads to, to Jesus' death because there was only one king and that's Caesar in the same way, you know, there is only one God, <laughs> there's only one Lord and that's Caesar. And then, so for the early Christians um, to be naming Jesus as that, that is, and it's still scandalous today, right? To say that it's not power and domination and wealth that uh, really matters uh, and that will save the world what will save the world is peace and justice and reconciliation love right that's, that's still you know hard for us to 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 get our heads and lives around 
Uh, can we go back to suffering? <laughs> <laughs> Always. Um, you know, I'd love to hear from Ian about suffering as 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 an artist, as a as a singer songwriter, as now a filmmaker. You know, what is your take on suffering? Is is suffering something that kind of inspires your art, or you know, is it something to kind of alleviate suffering, whether in yourself or in the world? You know, what what do you? What's up with suffering, Ian? <laughs> I'm smiling this entire time because I'm just like, well, it's a religious podcast, so I could say, you know, devil on one shoulder, angel on the <laughs> other. Do I go funny with this? Or do I go serious with this? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, where to, where to begin with suffering for art? Uh, um, well, I mean, for me, I think that... Um, Again, it's funny. I'm going to sound a bit biggest Springsteen fanboy, and I am, but I do like other artists. But there was another unrelated, completely interview quote recently where they were asking. I think it was Howard Stern, where Springsteen was on there recently for like an hour and a half, and uh, they asked him about his songwriting, and he said, "You know, I'm a I'm a fraud. Like I was never like the blue collar worker working in the factory or any of that. Like the the whole image that he kind of came up on, like that was not. He was just playing in the club since he was 16. You know, he didn't live the life of the songs and the people that he wrote about. But he did talk about his father living that life and how um, you know he was sort of has become the agent of his father's story because he knew his father would never." that story would remain untold otherwise, you know, that would not be communicated to, uh, you know, all of the triumphs and tragedies that come with, um, you know, that sort of uh, middle lower class life, you know, that he grew up with in his family. Um, and I thought that that was actually really beautiful, like in terms of, uh, you know, every artist, I think has, has uh, naturally had to question their purpose, certainly the pandemic, you know, underline that question, I think, for a lot of artists in terms of their value um, in society. Uh, and I think that that reason that Springsteen gave was as good as any, you know, he's helping to tell the stories of uh, people who who can't tell their own stories, you know, at least in that medium, you know, and it is something that I felt personally for a long time. You know, I've written a lot of songs. Most of them are not about me explicitly, though they're filtered through my lens. You know, when people ask, like, is this about you? That's the classic songwriting one-on-one question people ask. Are all these songs about you? It's like, well, no, you know, I don't, I always feel most artists have maybe one good breakup album in them, let's say. That's personal. <laughs> and after that, you know, even, even Dylan, you know, blood on the tracks, I guess. But like beyond that, you know, it's not just all about him all the time. You know, most good writers, when you think of the greats, Cohen, Joni Mitchell, whatever, it's not just all biographical. You know, it's all um, it's all trying to connect to other people's stories and understand them better. And there's, you know, when it's done, when you do it with an open heart, like there's a lot of empathy and understanding and connection that you feel in learning other people's stories and of course suffering is you know that's a, that's going to be a piece of it that's that's going to be the you know to put it in narrative terms that's going to be the 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 obstacle the struggle the thing the person is overcoming in their lives you know so certainly um so many of the songs i've written over the years have been inspired by um you know obviously i'm not specifically seeking out suffering as a uh, you know as a term when i'm looking at that but just someone will tell me a story that you know you're drawn to because you're like wow this person is going through something that you know maybe some of their best friends may not even realize they had gone through and you know so much of the album that i'm putting out now close to the bone both the film and music were inspired by some family stories of suffering you know my 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 mother's mother um, had rheumatoid arthritis and my mother cared for her when she was like a young teen, essentially, you know, and she remembers stories of like basically carrying her mother upstairs when she couldn't walk up the stairs anymore. And, you know, when we started screening the film last year, um, you know, the people who would come up and, and talk about it uh, with me more explicitly than just saying, you know, good job or we, we liked it or whatever. If the discussion went beyond that, it, it would often be people who had, experience similar things, you know, behind the closed doors, you know, that sort of uh, 
poetry of ordinary life you know poetry doesn't necessarily have to be happy it's also heartbreaking and sad you know and it's it's like this is this is what we all go through you know so i think in that sense uh um you know obviously uh art is there to make us feel less alone and to help us understand things uh maybe in a new way um that's the broadest way i could probably put that definition and i think uh you know for me uh my inspiration has been trying to tell those stories of other people and maybe you know through that understand their suffering or alleviate it a little bit through that connection to know that we're all living a similar human experience i love that and to me and joanne will know what i mean when i say this that's very metzian <laughs> I get that said to me. You you oh, made up that word. <laughs> so one of mine and Joanne's favorite theologians is uh, Johann Baptist Metz. And so um, he talks a lot about the importance of narrative and the importance of memory and in that the importance of solidarity. And I think that's exactly what you were just saying, right? But Johan the, and I are tight. I just call him <laughs> Yo. Yeah, uh, Joanne, I don't know if you wanted to speak to that because that's something actually you and I talked about before. Yeah, and I think, and I was thinking the same thing. I was thinking you were thinking it too. Um, and and that's, I mean, for Johann Baptist, that's really the source of hope in stories of suffering, right? He would say all stories of suffering participate in this story of suffering, the story of the passion of Christ. And, um, and so, you know, so all around the world, you have stories of people who are suffering, and it is. Because uh, in in telling the narrative and and sharing the memory um, that that changes us and causes us to act then in solidarity with that story with that person that's in some ways gives them resurrection gives them life purpose and also breeds hope um, because he he says that those stories of suffering uh, challenge our sort of middle class uh, comfortability right and he so he calls them dangerous memories stories of suffering are, are dangerous not all stories of suffering but many stories are dangerous memories because they challenge you know so what we're talking about what power is who what you know challenges yeah those sort of notions the strong and powerful are the best and so so maybe those who suffer and those who care for them and love them you know maybe that's more important so they're dangerous. Yeah. And he talks about the dangerous memory of Jesus, right? And so that what the church does Sunday after Sunday. So like the 12, 13 year old Ian Foster that was struggling with, well, why are we doing all this stuff? Metz would say the, the whole point of it is to remember the story, right? But not just Jesus's story, but the suffering of all people who suffer unjustly. And then from that, to be moved to solidarity, right? To to be with them, to stand with them, and and I guess then to take it to a like a liberation theology perspective is to do something about that, right? Like to 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 try to. Wait, are we it... supposed to do something as well? <laughs> yes, yeah, so the Father Boy used to tell us that the most important part of the Eucharist is the dismissal. You hear the story, you enact the story, and then you have to go and act in accordance to the story. And um, that's the most important part. And I would 100%. say that it's one of the things I've always respected about well, both of you, I think, is that you you do have that community engagement element that's been so important to to what you do, which to me has always been the strength of any any community group, in this case, the church. But, you know, that is that is the the re that's the reason for its existence in modern times, I think. Yeah, I used to have a reputation at a certain time in my life that uh, every church I was in had a petition of some kind in the back. <laughs> Here, send this postcard. Here, write this letter. But yes, no, I mean, if if we if we believe this story, um, you know, if we believe that, that we're called to uh, live out of a different set of values, then we need to work at that. Yeah, and I think to go back to the, I keep wanting to go back to suffering. I don't know what that says about me. But <laughs> Pretty emo. <laughs> uh, but just the idea that, you know, if you interpret this story from a, you know, if you're not interested in the history and the politics that we've been talking about and you're coming at this from a strictly theological perspective, well, then what does it say about God, that God suffers? 
right? God doesn't run away from it. God chooses even more radically. God didn't have to. Right. You talk about solidarity, right? So that God enters into suffering. To me, the most powerful line from um, at least from Matthew and Mark's version of the passion story is when Jesus cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right. And just that existential hole that opens up there. If you think that this person on that cross is God, you have a moment where God doubts God, like, <laughs> right. You know, but God chooses to enter so fully into our story that um, you know, God suffers along with us, which is compassion. That's mm -hmm. literally what that word means, right? And, you know, there's nothing, and Joanne and I are always adamant about this, there's nothing inherently salvific about suffering. Because if it was, we'd all just go out and seek suffering and, you know, but you don't have to go and seek suffering. To be human is to suffer, right? And I, th I think that, the, you know, what the story of the cross tells us is that when we are in solidarity with each other and in, in the practice of compassion, suffering with and coming alongside and remembering and telling the story and then, you know, being um, inspired into action, that's the whole point of the passion narrative. That's the whole point of what we call Good Friday. And that act in and of itself, I think, is the Easter story which is the new life that comes from it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that, you know, you, and I think I said this last week and I'll say it again, because I think it's very profound, <laughs> but the idea, you know, we, we tend to think of, you know, that suffering brings us closer to God and people get really pious about that. And I think there's a lot of bad theology around that, but I think the more, um, the better idea is to say that no, in suffering, God comes closer to us because God has already entered into it, right? Um, and so, you know, the high idea of solidarity and remembering and sharing in the stories, I think there's something. And that's what artists do. And I, you know, I think that's why it's, artists are important. And there's a lot of similarities in the work of artists, whether they be um, musicians, painters, poets, theologians, priests, pastors, clergy, when, when they're when they're actually entering into this the story that we're talking about, I think this is what they do as well. Uh, Ian, any last words, profound last words for us? I think we did it. I think we've got it covered. See you next Easter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we always like to close out with one of the alternative colics, uh, and these colics usually kind of summarize the themes that we've talked about. Um, and this one in particular kind of turns our attention um, into Holy Week and into following that path. Um, it's not a very popular path, and a path of kind of self-emptying, path of compassion, uh, the path of of Jesus, really, that he walks in that last week. Let us pray. Holy and immortal God, as we enter into this holy week, turn our hearts to Jerusalem so that united with Christ and all the faithful, we may enter the city not made with hands, your promised realm of justice and peace, eternal from age to age. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Ian. This has been a lot of fun. And you and I got to get together again soon now for our regular coffee slash beer 100%. chat. 100%. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. And everyone, do yourself a favor. Get on to Google. Find Ian Foster's music. In particular, his latest single, um, Pre-Existing Condition. Listen to it. My favorite Ian Foster song is Voyager. I think it's it's amazing. It's going to change your life. Go and listen to it. <laughs> and and a reminder to everyone, uh, this upcoming week is going to be very busy. A lot going on. Take care of yourself. Get lots of rest. Stay hydrated. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And thank you all for joining us uh, throughout this Lenten season. We hope we've inspired you, challenged you. Um, and so we'll, we'll see you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.